Welcome to the second half of the lecture on bacteriology. Uh, today we're going to talk about gram-positive rods, gram-negative rods, and then move into the anaerobic bacteriology. So let's get started with Carinobacterium. Uh, there's over 20 species. Most of these are saprophytic organisms. They're part of the human normal flora, especially skin and nares. Most grow very well on 5% sheep's blood auger. They're gamma hemolytic gray colonies, catalase enzyme positive. They have what's called a diphthroid morphology, which if you look at the gram stain on the right-hand side, you can see that the gram positive rods are in Chinese letter forms. Also notice that there's no spores that are produced. The most important species of the genera is Carinobacterium diphtheria. And of course, this is the agent of diphtheria. It forms very tough oropharyngeal membranes on the throat area, and they're very difficult to remove and will bleed when tried to remove them. Diphthroid is, of course, Greek for leather. These very tough membranes are produced from a phage-mediated exotoxin. It's distributed from this membrane, causing respiratory paralysis, heart, nervous system, and kidney damage. Non-toxin-producing strains of C. diphtheria do exist, and they're found in cultures of ulcers and lesions, and we have seen them mostly in our homeless populations. Diagnosis of C. diphtheria used to be dependent upon culture and toxin detection, looking for the toxin using an immunodiffusion method known as the ELEC plate. But more recent times, we've used serology and of course, recently it's been PCR to study the toxin genes to make sure that the C. diphtheria that was isolated is capable of producing toxin. The organism grows well on 5% sheath blood auger, but would look like most of the other uh, carinobacteria, gray gamma hemolytic colonies and catalase enzyme positive. So historically, we would have used a cysteine telluride auger. This is a selective and differential medium for Carinobacterium diphtheria, and the colonies turn black. We could have also used what was called metachromatic storage granule staining. This is when we would have grown the suspect C. diphtheria on Loeffler's egg-containing media, and then stained it with methylene blue. You can see on the right-hand side what the metachromatic granules would have looked like. Treatment, of course, you need to get rid of the toxin by the use of antitoxin, and you can treat with either erythromycin or penicillin. Other Carinobacterium species are also important, but does not have the public health significance of C. diphtheria. One of the primary ones is Carinobacterium jkeum. This is found on the normal human skin, and it loves lipid. It primarily infects patients with indwelling plastic catheters and devices and can lead to bacteremia. Biofilms are formed on the plastic, protecting the organisms from antibiotic treatment. This organism is fairly resistant and is only susceptible to vancomycin and tetracycline. Carinobacterium urealyticum is another um, Carinobacterium species that mostly causes just urinary tract infection in post-renal transplants. As the name implies, it has the urease enzyme, and you can see over the right-hand side will produce a positive urease result. It is resistant to many antibiotics, but vancomycin is susceptible. Bacillus species. Bacillus species is a large gram-positive rod with square ends. It can easily be decolorized, and you have to be very cautious when you're reading gram stains because it can over decolorize and almost look like it's a gram negative rod. Of course, bacillus species all produce spores. They can sometimes be visualized on gram stains, and as you see in the center slide, you can see where there is a void of gram staining where the spore is present. All of the bacillus species are catalase enzyme positive. Bacillus anthracis is the most important of the bacillus species. It's an agent of anthrax and, of course, is mostly found in herbivores. It's a category A agent, which means it's a very high priority pathogen and could even be a potential agent of bioterrorism. The virulence factors are anthrax toxin, 
and capsular polypeptide. Infections, you can see on the upper right hand side, this is probably the most common one produced from Bacillus anthracis, which is known as wool sorters disease. This is caused from someone handling infected hides imported from other countries. It produces a unique black eschar skin lesion. Systemic infections can also exist, causing pneumonia, sepsis, and meningitis. If you look at the blood auger plate, you'll see that there is a regular shape to the colony border on the 5% sheep's blood auger. No hemolysis. Also, if you were to use a loop or stick, you could pick up the colony. It'll stand straight up. That's known as a Medusa head colony. Bacillus are non-motile and susceptible to penicillin, and this can be used to separate it from other Bacillus species. Bacillus cereus is the most common species causing infection in the normal population. It's a saprophytic environmental organism and usually causes nosocomial and opportunistic infections, particularly in the immunocompromised patient and patients that have indwelling or implanted devices. It can be a contaminant in blood cultures from just being an environmental organism on the skin but you can have major skin infections and blood culture infections in intravenous drug users. It's associated with food poisoning due to an emetic toxin production, and it can also, call, also cause a diarrheal disease from a diarrheal toxin. It's a gram-positive rod and produces spores and would look much like a bacillus anthracis on a gram stain. But notice the difference in the colony. If you look at the colony of this organism, you can see that it is clearly dry and crumbly looking and is very beta hemolytic on a 5% scent uh, blood auger plate. It will be catalase positive and motile and resistant to penicillin. So that will differ it from Bacillus anthracis. It is motile and resistant to penicillin. Listeria monocytogenes. This is a very important organism for public health. It's a small gram positive rod and does not produce spores. It's catalase enzyme positive. It grows very well on a blood auger plate, as you can see on the right hand side, and it produces subtle beta hemolysis. And the colony looks very similar to a beta strep group B. Motility provides identifying information it is interesting that it's more modal at 25 degrees than at 35 degrees. As we will learn, this organism really likes, to, really likes to grow in colder temperatures, so very modal at 25. It also has a characteristic motility known as tumbling motility on a wet mount examination. And if you inoculate it into a semi-solid auger, like shown on the right-hand side, you will see that it has umbrella motility it can cause bacteremia and meningitis in the immune suppressed, in pregnancy, neonates, and the elderly. The organism is very easy to culture, molecular amplification methods capable of detecting it, detecting it both from blood cultures and from CSF. As I said, it loves to grow cold. It grows very well at four degrees. It does not just stay alive, it actually replicates. And you can, uh, because of this, you can acquire infection from eating refrigerated foods, particularly non-pasteurized cheese and milk products and deli case foods. Ampicillin is considered a drug of choice. This organism is intrinsically resistant to the cephalosporin antibiotics. And that's why it's so important that you do differentiate it from group B strep, where the primary drugs of choice are the cephalosporin antibiotics. Erysiplethrix rusiopathy is a very interesting organism. Small pleomorphic gram-positive rod, as you see in the gram stain. Also notice the growth on the auger plate. It is alpha hemolytic colonies. There's no spores produced and it's catalase enzyme negative. It is noteworthy to remember that it's the only gram-positive rod that produces hydrogen sulfide. Um, and this is shown in this picture uh, where it is growing in a triple sugar iron auger. Notice the black discoloration of the auger. 
that is hydrogen sulfide production. Most would say that Malditoff is necessary for this difficult to identify bacteria. Human infections are from nature and from animals, mostly swine, and it is considered an occupational disease of farmers and butchers. The disease in swine is known as erysipelas and causes lacy, thick infection, skin infection on the pig. Virulence factor is a capsule, soft tissue infection and bacteremia with endocarditis production, and it's intrinsically resistant to vancomycin. Next, we will move into the most important gram-negative bacilli. There are hundreds of gram-negative bacilli, and there's really not time to discuss all of them. You would have to do further reading if you're interested in learning about some that are not included in this lecture. The most important of all the gram-negative rods, and by far the most common, is Escherichia coli. It's, of course, normal flora in the human intestine and is the primary cause of urinary tract infection. But it can also cause bacteremia, neonatal meningitis, and abdominal infections. It grows very well on the conchi auger, where it lact is a lactose fermenter, as you can see from the pink production uh, of color on the, lac on the McConkey auger. Also, you can grow this organism on ESN methylene blue auger, and you will get green sheen on that auger. One of the most um, identifiable reactions for E. coli is a spot indole reaction. Notice on the right-hand side that when, when you do a spot indole reaction, it turns robin's egg blue. This is done from organisms growing on a blood auger plate. Blood auger contains tryptophan, and indole is a breakdown product of tryptophan. So you must use organisms growing on a blood auger plate to perform the spot indole reaction. E. coli is a pathogen of diarrhea also. It, has, um, it can be enterotoxigenic or ETEC E. coli, which is the primary cause of traveler's diarrhea. A more serious type of diarrhea caused by E. coli is enterohemorrhagic E. coli or EHEC. This is uh, one of the organisms known for this is O157H7 E. coli but there are many different serotypes which can cause this type of diarrhea. This diarrhea can be bloody and is normally acquired from eating undercooked beef, particularly hamburger meat. The pathogenicity is from two types of shiga toxin. It, besides diarrhea, it can move forward into a more serious disease of hemolytic uremic syndrome. This can result with hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal failure, particularly in a young child. You can grow the um, hemorrhagic E. coli on the conchi auger that contains sorbitol instead of lactose. Your EHEC organisms are known to be negative on sorbitol. They will not ferment sorbitol, and these are um, somewhat characteristic of the EHEC organisms. By far the most sensitive way to look for these is by doing molecular detection. Other gram-negative rods that are very important that also ferment lactose are the Enterobacters and the Klebsiellas. Enterobacter species, the most important one is Cloaca. It is an environmental gram-negative rod with very low pathogenicity. Usually it only infects a compromised host. There is one um, recently renamed Enterobacter species, Chronobacter sagasaki, that has also been very strongly associated with reporting in neonatal meningitis. Klebsiella species, the most important species, is pneumoniae. It is, usually produces a very mucoid colony when grown on the conchi auger and blood auger, and this is due to capsule production. Klebsiella uh, pneumonia also has a very interesting thing that can occur in alcoholics uh, if they have a pneumonia and it can be mixed with blood in the lung and, perform, and produces what's known as current jelly sputum. Other gram-negative rods, but these do not ferment lactose. Let's talk about proteus species. As you see in the picture, proteus species is known for having consent, um, swarming layers on the auger surface. Proteus vulgaris will be spot indole positive. 
Proteus mirabilis is spot indole negative. And those are your two most important species of Proteus. They are found as normal flora in the intestine and are a common cause of urinary tract infection and abdominal infections. Serratia marcescens, a very interesting environmental organism. Look at the picture on the right hand side. You can see how it produces an intense red pigmentation. This tends to increase in color um, over the days, particularly if incubated at room temperature. This organism is found in the environment and usually only causes infection in an immune suppressed, someone with a ventilator associated pneumonia and bacteremia, usually when IV lines are in place. This is somewhat of a historic picture of a triple sugar iron auger, but this was used as, and has been used for many decades to help you know how an organism might ferment a sugar also if it produces hydrogen sulfide. If we start with tube number one on the left hand side, you can see that this depicts carbohydrate fermentation because the entire tube has turned yellow. So this organism ferments glucose, lactose, lactose and or sucrose. To do this test, of course, you've stabbed the organism into the media and streaked um, the organism on the auger slant. So this number one tube is fermenting all the carbohydrates and also notice that it's disrupting the auger due to gas production. Tube number two is only yellow in the butt of the tube. It is only fermenting glucose. That would be like a shigella. Tube number three, the butt would be yellow, but it is obscured by the production of hydrogen sulfide. It is only producing glucose, not fermenting lactose or sucrose, and this would be like a proteus or a salmonella. And then number two, number four, is what the tube looks like when you first buy the tube, and it is uninoculated. And if you inoculate an organism which is not capable of fermenting glucose, lactose, or sucrose, this is what it looks like. This would be typical of a non-fermenter gram-negative rod, such as a Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now let's talk about some of the most important uh, species of uh, gram-negative rods that do not ferment lactose. Let's start with salmonella species. This causes a diarrhea, can have fever, and can have polys in the stool. This is usually acquired from infection from eating contaminated food. <clears throat> usually raw eggs, poultry, ground beef, or dairy, or you could have direct contact with a sick animal. To get sick with this organism, you must ingest a large number of organisms. If you have a normal level of stomach acid, it can oftentimes be protective and keep you from getting this infection. <clears throat> McConkey auger, it, as I said, it does not ferment lactose. It produces hydrogen sulfide on selective augers, as shown on the right-hand side of that TSI auger that we just talked about. It's motile. It has many flagella, and that can be used and help us in the identification based on a biochemical and serologic typing scheme known as the Kaufman-White typing. There's over 200 or 250 species of salmonella, so biochemicals alone cannot speciate the salmonella. So we have to use the Kaufman-White serologic typing for speciation. This makes use of the somatic cell wall antigen, the flagellar antigens that are produced, and the VI capsular antigen. <clears throat> Salmonella typhi is a little bit different than Salmonella's um, regular species. It produces, of course, typhoid fever, which is a high fever and sepsis with no diarrhea. It's a human pathogen. Most cases in the U.S. are from foreign international travel. Once you've had salmonella typhi and you have been cured of it, even with proper antimicrobial therapy, you can have a post-typhoid fever where there can be carriage in the gallbladder with passage in the feces. This can then be transmitted by bad hygiene and food preparation to others. If you ingest the organisms from this transmission, it can enter the bowel, move into the bloodstream, and eventually the bone marrow. So this makes up something interesting fact to remember about salmonella typhi. 
When you're trying to diagnose this infection, in early infections, oftentimes the blood cultures will be positive. But in later stages, after one month, often you have to go to the bone marrow to look for the organism. This is very uncommon. There's very few infections in bacteriology where bone marrow becomes one of the primary specimens. The VI capsular antigen that we talked about in the Kaufman White scheme is the antigen that you look for if you're uh, looking to identify Salmonella typhi. The other thing that can be interesting is what it looks like on a TSI slant. If you see over on the right, right hand side, it has what's called the mustache of hydrogen sulfide, where it has just a band on the center part of the slant. Shigella, this is a pathogen of diarrhea. And it can oftentimes cause vomiting. <clears throat> Between the diarrhea and the vomiting, it can lead to a lot of fluid loss, particularly in young children. It can also cause PMNs and blood in the stool. Infection is usually human-to-human -human transmission, and you control transmission with good hand hygiene. Unlike Salmonella, it takes very few organisms of Shigella to make you ill. It does not, lactose, uh, does not ferment lactose, as you can see from the picture of the McConkie auger. It is non-motile, no hydrogen sulfide produced, and there's only four species of Shigella. So that makes it very different than Salmonella. There's special augers that we can use doing stool cultures to look for both Salmonella and Shigella. Decades past, we would have more likely used Salmonella Shigella auger. On this auger, Shigella would produce a colorless colony on this sort of beigey, golden colored plate, where Salmonella would have produced H2S, turning somewhat black. Over the last 25 years or so, we've moved to using Hectone auger. It gives you a much clearer color differentiation between all the organisms in the stool. On this auger, Salmonella, due to H2S production, will produce black colonies. Shigella will be green, and your normal flora organisms like E. coli in the stool will be orange. Yersinia enterocolitica. This is a major reservoir in swine. Humans are infected by eating raw or undercooked pork. Infection is primarily diarrhea. It's usually not a very serious diarrhea, but might require medical attention. More serious things that Yersinia can do, however, are septicemia in patients with an iron overload syndrome, mesenteric adenitis, which is infection symptomatic for right lower abdominal pain and very much mimics appendicitis. There's also been reports of infected blood products from tra transfusions. This is because this organism can grow very well at four degrees. It is also oxidase negative, indole negative, and urease positive. If you're in an area of the country and are um, in search of Yersinia intracolyticus, uh, you can use what's called CIN auger. It is selective for Yersinia intracolytica and turns this bright pink color, and that can help you separate this organism from normal flora. Yersinia pestis. Of course, this is a very serious organism. It is the cause of plague. It's a category A agent, and certainly you would want to alert the public health department if you were ever suspicious of isolating this organism. In nature, it has an obligate flea, rodent flea cycle, and humans usually have infection from being bit by a rat flea. As you see in the picture, it can lead to what's called bubonic plague. That is when you have infection of the lymphatic system and it can form very painful buboes due to lymph node swelling at the site of the bite. The hemorrhagic lymph nodes then spread the Yersinia pestis into the bloodstream. Pneumonia can develop from the bloodstream invasion. It can be a very high uh, fatality risk with Yersinia infection, greater than 50%. It's endemic in Southwest United States. 
This organism is not difficult to grow at all. It grows very well in a blood auger, just as a gray non-hemolytic colony, catalase positive and oxidase negative. By far one of the most leading uh, features of this organism is what's known as bipolar staining. If you look at the gram stain there in, that's pictured, you can see how the stain looks like a, a safety pin with the stains on the two ends of the organism in an open area in the center. Vibrio cholera. This is a natural environment is in salt water. This organism loves salt and salt actually enhances its growth. You can see the picture of what the classic stool would look like from someone that has ongoing Vibrio cholera diarrhea. It is known as a rice water stool due to the mucus flecks that are in the stool. Virulence for this organism is due to an enterotoxin that is produced. It has a receptor on, uh, it will uh, bind to the receptor on an epithelial cell in the small bowel. It activates adenyl cyclase, which then will increase cyclic AMP and have a hypersecretion of sodium chloride and uh, water. As you can see from the picture of the stool, you have massive dehydration and it can lead to metabolic acidosis. This is particularly an issue in small children. So your primary um, uh, treatment of Vibrio cholera is fluid replacement. It has a curved C-shaped gram-negative rod, if we do a gram stain. It grows very well in a selective media known as thiocitrate bile sucrose agar. You can see the agar pictured on the right-hand side. TCBS is a green colored agar, and when Vibrio cholera grows on it, this agar, it, it uh, ferments the sucrose and will turn yellow. It's also oxidase positive, and I, as I said, it loves salt, so it grows very well in a 1% salt solution. Vibrio parahemolyticus is not nearly as serious as a diarrheal disease as is cholera. You usually have it from ingestion of raw oysters. Oftentimes it can be self-limited, but sometimes it can be serious and more progressive in an immune suppressed host. Once again, you can use TCBS medium to grow the organism, but Vibrio parahemolyticus will not ferment sucrose, so the colony will remain green. Vibrio vulnificus is a very important Vibrio species. It is also from infection from ingestion of raw shellfish. It leads to diarrhea in some and can be the primary disease. However, in some, it can be a more progressive infection. You can get quite serious skin infections from having injury while in water, or you can be very unlucky and have a bacteremia. In bacteremia, it usually is caused in patients with liver disease usually cirrhosis, in patients with increased serum iron. It will cause um, a very painful necrotic skin leisure, lesion on the lower extremities with massive uh, muscle necrosis. This, this can be a very fatal disease if not treated very rapidly. Acinetobacter bamanii. This is an environmental organism and it can also be found on normal flora of the human skin. It's not a rod, it's more of a gram-negative coccoid bacilli and can, could sometimes possibly be, be uh, confused with Neisseria on a gram stain. It does not ferment lactose, as you can see on the right-hand side, but does tend to produce kind of a light purple color. It's oxidase enzyme negative. It's an opportunistic nosocomial pathogen. It's a very effective one and it can, um, uh, adhere to uh, endotrach tubes, IV catheters, and such. And over time, it can acquire resistance to many antibiotics from antibiotic exposure. Stenotrophomonas maltophilia. This is a rapid maltose oxidizer. It's a longer gram-negative bacillus. Its characteristic of note is it has kind of a funny bluish-gray pigment known as gun metal gray and is much more bluish gray than your normal gram-negative rod. It is intrinsic resistant to many antibiotics and is a very troublesome nosocomial pathogen. 
It can be a super colonizer after long-term carbapenem therapy due to intrinsic resistance to the carbapenem antibiotics. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a very common organism seen in the laboratory because it's very common in, our, in, in nature. It's found in uh, natural water supplies. When you grow the organism, you will notice that it has a blue-green pigment that fluoresces, known as pyocyanin, and that is pictured on the right-hand side. This organism has an oxidase enzyme that is produced. It has a very characteristic grape-like odor. It grows very well at 42 degrees. Most organisms do not like to grow at that high of a temperature. Its very close relative, Pseudomonas fluorescens putida, does not grow at 42, and we used to use that as a characteristic to differentiate, differentiate these organisms. One thing to always remember about Pseudomonas aeruginosa is it is a major pathogen of cystic fibrosis. Mucoid strains produced in the lung due to the production of a polysaccharide capsule, as you can see pictured on the right-hand side. The poor nutrition and poor oxygen status of a cystic's lung produce, uh, helps to, this organism to produce these features. The other thing that can happen with Pseudomonas aeruginosa it can come in partnership or co-infection with Burkholderia cepatia. And these two organisms together can cause very major lung damage in a cystic. It can also uh, be a nosocomial pathogen associated with exposure to water in most environments, and it's intrinsically resistant to many antibiotics. Crisiobacterium, or Elizabeth kingia now, uh, meningioscepticum, um, this organism is associated with newborn infections of fatal meningitis and septicemia. It can also cause infections in the elderly and immune suppressed. It's an environmental organism found normally in most tap waters. This has been reported a lot with uh, neti pot infections when people are using those for sinus issues. It's a yellow colony, oxidase and indole positive. Haemophilus drucuri. Uh, Ducreae is the cause of venereal disease called chancroid. As you can see in the picture, it can cause painful, necrotizing genital ulcers and inguinal lymphadenopathy. If you were to do a gram stain from these lesions, you would see what was called a school of fish appearance on the gram stain. This organism can be very difficult to grow. It requires hemen to be in the source of media used to grow on solid media. Haemophilus influenza is a very common organism that we see in the laboratory and mostly respiratory tract infections. And uh, it is transmission, is close contacts, and secretions. It has a capsular polysaccharide that is considered the virulence factor. If you look at the gram stain, you can see that it is a pleomorphic gram negative rod and naturally will have small and large shaped rods. It's important to remember that it requires two nutritional factors for growth, X factor or hemin and V factor, which is known as NAD. This um, means that it will not grow on a regular blood auger plate, but requires this X and V factor, which naturally occurs on a chocolate auger. And you can see in the upper right hand side a picture of growth of Haemophilus on chocolate auger. Also, because it will not grow on a regular blood auger plate, you can do what's called a satellite phenomena, which is shown in the picture on the far right. With a satellite phenomena, you would streak the Haemophilus organism all over a blood auger plate and then put streaks of Staph aureus over the top of it. Notice how it will have little tiny colonies growing right around the white Staph aureus streak. This is because Staph aureus supplies the X factor and the, N, um, the V factor rather, and the X factor is required from hemolysis of the blood. So that is a way through satellite phenomena that you could find Haemophilus influenza if you did not have access to chocolate auger. You would also want to incubate the plates in five to eight percent CO2 because Haemophilus influenza requires CO2 for growth. 
We are very fortunate that we have a effective vaccine that targets invasive infections with Haemophilus influenza type B. And this will effectively eliminate most childhood invasive infections. Ampicillin resistance is a, is a problem in H. flu. Uh, you have about 25% of the organisms that produce this beta-lactamase enzyme, making ampicillin not effective. The third generation cephalosporins become your most effective group of antibiotics for invasive infections. Haystack organisms. These are very interesting organisms that grow with oral flora in the human mouth. Due to poor teeth or invasive dental procedures, the organisms are introduced in the bloodstream and they can cause endocarditis. They're fastidious gram-negative cacobacilli and they need greater or equal to 48 hours to grow in a blood culture bottle and also to grow on a blood auger plate. It causes about 5 to 10 percent of community acquired native valve endocarditis that are not related to IV drug use. I've listed the species on this slide that comprise the HACEC group of organisms. It can be difficult to remember all of these um, biochemical features, but two organisms are really, I think, most important possibly to take note that have unusual features. The first one is Iconella carodens. Notice the name carodens. And this organism is unique as it pits the auger. And as it grows on a blood auger plate, it goes into the auger rather than causing a colony on top of the auger. It also has an unusual bleach smell to the colony. The other interesting one is Kingella kingii. It is the only uh, one of the haystacks that's hemolytic on blood auger. It's oxidase positive. And besides being a haystack organism and causing problems with endocarditis, it is also the major cause of septic joint infection in small children. Ortotella pertussis. This organism has certainly caused havoc over the last decade or so with multiple outbreaks across the United States. It's of course the cause of whooping cough. This disease starts as a prodromal or flu-like disease and that's its most contagious stage. Once the flu-like symptoms have um, moved forward, it goes into the classic hoop cough or the catarrhal stage. This is when the toxin will adhere to the bronchial epithelial cells and the cough will continue until the toxin wears off. And then uh, it will may go on for weeks to months and then you will go through the paroxysmal stage in the recovery phase. This is a human pathogen. It inhabits the nasopharynx and that is the specimen of choice. You would want to do an NP swab. If you uh, look at the peripheral blood in a patient that has active whooping cough disease, you can see lymphocytosis with atypical large, irregular, and deeply basophilic lymphocytes. And that's shown in the slide on the upper right. It's a very tiny gram-negative cacobacillus and can be difficult to grow. There is a selective media, if you would like to try, called Reagan Low Charcoal Auger. The auger uh, will support the growth of this organism in around three to five days in a CO2 environment. Molecular detections really become the standard of practice, greater sensitivity, and of course you can do it within hours rather than days. The reservoir for infection has always been the young adult due to waning immunity of their uh, childhood vaccine. That's why they started a booster program for children um, uh, heading to middle school or a little bit older, so this would pr uh, prevent outbreaks in younger children. Pasturella multosiva and canis. These are normal flora in many animals. It's considered a zoonotic infection, um, and it's uh, bite wound infections, mostly from the cats and dogs. You can also have a human pneumonia if you um, put your face too close to some of their little mouths and you uh, can get some of their secretions and such into your respiratory tract. It's a small gram-negative cacobacilli, as you can see in the gram stain. It grows very well on 5% sheep's blood auger. It's a non-hemolytic gray colony, will not grow on the conchi auger. It's oxidase positive, and it's one of the very few gram-negative rods that's sensitive to penicillin. Capnocytophaga. Look at the gram stain. 
It's what's called fusiform gram-negative rods. Extremely pleomorphic, and some of them are even kind of bulbous. Also look at the colony. This is also very unique. It has what are called finger-like projections, known as gliding. This colony glides. It means that the outer edge of the colony just kind of moves out just a little bit. It requires CO2 to grow, oxidase and catalase negative. This organism can be found as normal flora in both humans and animals. In animals, the primary one we normally see is Capnocytophaga canamorsis. It's normal flora in dogs' mouths and can cause infections from dog bites. It can be a very serious dog bite and can lead to bacteremia and endocarditis. There's many Capnocytophaga species that can cause, um, is in normal flora in the mouth, and could potentially invade the human. It's usually from infected mouth ulcers, such as induced by chemotherapy, and will lead to bacteremia. Brucella species. This is brucellosis. It's usually a fever of unknown origin. It can be kind of misleading because you don't really think it is, as a, a systemic disease, because one of the most significant uh, Site, uh, or types of uh, symptoms could be joint pain. It's an intracellular pathogen of the reticuloendothelial system. Like I said with Salmonella typhi, it's unusual to have bone marrow as a useful specimen for culture for a bacterial infection, but this is the other one which I would take note of. Um, oftentimes, brucella can end up being chronic infections and it can lead to blood and end up in the bone marrow. There's automated blood culture systems that can grow this organism in five to six days, but oftentimes we have to hold cultures longer than usual to find brucella. Also, if you do a bone marrow exam, the histopathology, it will produce granulomas in the bone marrow. Serology can assist with diagnosis of chronic disease, but we can grow the organism. It is slow growing, a gram negative cacobacilli a non-hemolytic gray colony. It requires CO2 to grow and you must be patient because it could take two to three days to grow on a blood auger plate. Oxidase and urease enzyme positive. The animal or animal product that you've had contact with will determine what species of brucella that you acquire. If you were around a cow, you will have abortus. If you've had raw goat milk products, you will have melatensis and exposure to pigs and dogs would give you suus or canis. Campylobacter species. There's two primary species, jejuni and fetus. Jejuni is the cause of diarrhea. It's very common cause in the United States. It's usually just a diarrheal disease, but it can cause bacteremia and HIV and the immune suppressed. This is caused by the ingestion of undercooked poultry, or misuse of cutting boards and such that have had uh, um, the chicken juice on the uh, cutting board and exposing raw vegetables and such to the cutting board. The organism has a very classic gram stain. It's called seagull shaped. It's poorly staining gram negative rod. The culture requires selective blood auger containing antibiotics because it grows very slowly and we're working with stool specimens with lots of normal flora. You can use skeroids blood auger or a campy blood auger. You need to incubate them at 42 degrees once again to discourage the growth of normal flora in a microaerophilic atmosphere with high CO2 and low O2. One of the things most significant to remember about Campylobacter jejuni diarrhea is yes, the diarrhea can be serious itself, but two weeks post recovery from C. jejuni diarrhea, you can have the sequelae of Guillain Barre syndrome. Campylobacter fetus is known to cause bacteremia in the immune suppressed host. Its primarily source is food from cattle or sheep. In, uh, before Maldi-Toff, which can be very easily used for diagnosis or identification of these two organisms, we would use temperature tolerance. Jejuni likes to grow hot and grows very well at 42, where fetus prefers cooler temperatures. Also, you can use a hippurate hydrolysis reaction 
to differ the two species. Francisella tularensis. The reservoir is rabbits, rodents, ticks, and flies. Humans are infected by insect bites or from exposure to animal blood, such as skinning rabbits with bare hands. This is because the bacteria can penetrate small breaks in the skin. As the picture shows, it can cause very painful skin lesions and enlarged lymph nodes. This can then lead to bacteremia, which forms the most common form of this disease known as ulcero ulceroglandular tularemia. Also from blood invasion, it can lead to pneumonia. It's a small gram-negative rod, oxidase negative, and it's important to remember in the laboratory that it requires cysteine to grow, so you must include a chocolate auger or other medium which has cysteine. Helicobacter pylori. This is acute gastritis with a small percentage that can progress to gastric adenose carcinoma. Human-to-human -human transmission is very common. Many of us have been infected with Helicobacter pylori, although we may have not had symptoms. It's fecal oral route with poor hygiene. One of the ways that you can identify it by point of care diagnosis even, is by making use of its rapid and strong urease enzyme production. You can just put a piece of the gastric antrum biopsy into a, a swatch of urease medium and it will turn red in about 30 minutes to an hour. It's a small curved gram-negative bacilli, can be very difficult to grow in culture. Because of that, we have other methods to use, such as stool antigen for diagnosis, and also you can do stool antigen to test of cure. If you've cleared the antigen from your stool, your antimicrobial therapy has been effective. Serum antibody detection is considered obsolete. It is not clinically useful because you can have a serum antibody without having an active infection. The organism stained by silver stains in gastric biopsies. The treatment is antibiotics and stomach acid suppression. Legionella pneumophila. This organism is a pulmonary disease from exposure to water. There's been many news reports showing uh, sitting next to huge water displays like shown in this picture can aerosolize the Legionella and be inhaled. This organism requires cysteine in culture media. Notice in the picture it, the organism will not grow on blood auger but grows very well on a selective media for Legionella known as buffered charcoal yeast extract auger. But it does take about three to five days to grow. This organism is very unusual and because it will not uh, gram stain well with a regular gram stain reagents. You can do a counter stain with carbyl fuchsin, but few laboratories would do that. So it can be difficult to stain uh, in direct specimens. You can use silver impregnation stains in fixed tissue because gram stain would not be effective. The diagnosis in the laboratory is usually a urinary antigen test done by enzyme immunoassay, and it can detect Legionella pneumophila type 1, the most common Legionella species found in pulmonary infection. Serology tests are available, but they're seldom used. Most will go to the urinary antigen. Treatment is a macrolide. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about some of the unusual bacteria that do not have cell walls. First two are mycoplasma and ureaplasma species. They have only cell membranes. To be able to grow these organisms, you would need to use a media with sterols. Molecular amplification is becoming the current and best diagnostic method of choice for these organisms. Because it does not have a cell wall, you cannot, it lacks the peptidoglycan, so you can't use a gram stain, and also you cannot use antibiotics that act by inhibiting cell wall formation. Mycoplasma pneumonia, of course, is the, a common cause of community-acquired pneumonia. It can also be detected by presence of high titer agglutinins. Also, there are molecular amplification tests to look for mycoplasma pneumonia. Genital mycoplasmas are mycoplasma hominis and ureaplasma ureolyticum. Mycoplasma hominis has a very characteristic appearance on sterol-containing media, 
notice the fried egg appearance shown in the picture. This causes a variety of uh, female infections concerning vaginitis, cervicitis, postpartum sepsis, neonatal infections, and pre-rupture of membranes. Urea plasma urea lyticum forms a very dark metal-like appearance on the, the sterol-containing media. It has rapid urea hydrolysis, as one could tell by the name, and it also causes similar diseases of non-gonococcal urethritis, upper genital tract infection, spontaneous abortion, and neonatal infection. Next, we're going to go through some very unusual organisms and talk about their association with disease. They can be difficult to grow, bacteria. Often uh, they need serologic and molecular assays for diagnosis. The first one is Bartonella henseli. This is the cause of cat scratch disease from exposure to cat and cat excrement. It can progress on to bacillary angiomatosis. Bartonella quintana is the cause of trench fever. It is acquired by being bitten by the body louse. Chlamydia trachomatis, cerevars L1, 2, and 3, are the cause of lymphogranuloma venereum. This is an STD that involves lymphatics and lymph nodes. Chlamydia pneumonia is a cause of pneumonia, and chlamydia cytosy is the chlamydia that you associate with exposure to exotic parrots, and it is a cause of pneumonia. Klebsiella, or Chlamydobacterium granulomatosis, um, or granulomatous is the cause of granuloma inguinale. That's an, also an STD. It can lead to very bad ulcerative genital lesions. Streptomanilis maniliaformis is the cause of rat bite fever. It is caused from the serious bite of a rat. It is a cell wall deficient bacteria known as an L form. Very difficult for us to grow will not grow in the usual blood cultures, so you really need a clinical history for this and uh, to know of the rat bite. Trophoma uh, whippleii is the cause of Whipple's disease. This is a gram-positive rod or an actinomycete, a very difficult, uh, very distant relative of two mycobacterium species. It's found in soil and farm animals and causes a diarrhea that can lead to malabsorption. It has characteristic findings in fixed tissue of a foamy macrophage in the lamina propria. Ehrlichiosis. This is an infection caused by a rickettsia bacteria, and it's zoonotic and an intracellular pathogen. The primary vector is the exodes tick, which is the hard tick shown in the picture. Two genera of Ehrlichia can, um, can exist, Anaplasma and your Ehrlichia species. They differ by where they cause the inclusion. The anaplasma causes the inclusion or morula production in a PMN. Ehrlichia species causes this same type of morula picture in a monocyte. They cause fever, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia, leading to elevated serum aminotransferases. Ehrlichia does not have a rash. It is found in the same part of the country with Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever and has very similar uh, features to rickettsia, rickettsia infection, except it does not have the rash that Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever has. As you can see, it's found in South Central, Southeast, and Southwest United States. And you can look at, uh, detect this organism by PCR, serology, and examining the blood film. Borrelia burgdorferi, this is caused by the spirochete, and it is the cause of Lyme's disease. Primarily found in northeastern part of the U.S., once again, the hard tick, exodes tick, is the culprit. It causes an acute disease of fatigue, headache, fever, and rash. Certainly can progress to a chronic disease, serology, and PCR for diagnosis. Other Borrelia species can cause tick-borne relapsing fever. This is found in the United States. Very high relapsing fever with thrombocytopenia with muscle and joint aches. The vector of this one is the soft tick shown in the picture. And if you look at the blood smear, you can observe the spirochete or Borrelia in the blood film. 
Treponema pallidum, the cause of syphilis. RPR and BDRL, BDRL tests for antibody detection are the, the tests of choice. There are new antibody algorithms that can help with the diagnosis of this infection. In years past, we used what was called the dark field to view the spirochete that's present in the Shanker lesion. Brachyspira is an intestinal spirochete found on the brush border of the intestine with a questionable role in disease. Leptospira interrogans is the cause of leptospirosis. This is a fever with rash and renal involvement. It is associated with being exposed to contaminated water supplies where rats or other animals have urinated into the water. In leptospirosis, you will see that the, the organism spirochete has a shepherd's crook shaped where both ends are bent. You can see the organism in the renal tubule upon staining. Bacterial vaginosis. This is a mixed anaerobic aerobic bacterial infection. It's rather benign infection except in pregnancy where it can be quite serious. The discharge is usually a fish-like odor with an alkaline pH. Usually normal flora organisms of lactobacillus are in great quantity in the vaginal area, but if something happens to uh, destroy the lactobacillus and the numbers decrease, Gardnerella and Mobiluncus can take over. And they're your marker organisms for bacterial vaginosis, particularly Gardnerella vaginalis. A better way than doing cultures for those organisms is to look for clue cells, which can be diagnostic, or even better yet, there's new molecular probe assays and other amplification assays that are part of women's health screening programs, which can look for bacterial vaginosis. That concludes the aerobic part of bacteria. Now we're just gonna go through some of the most important um, areas of anaerobic bacteria. Anaerobic infections can occur in virtually any organ or region of the body. Most infections are polymicrobial and they can include both aerobic and anaerobic species. Most of the um, anaerobes that cause the problems are from endogenous um, origin. They're part of your normal flora. For some reason, there's been um, an increase in numbers, usually due to some trauma event, vascular or tissue necrosis, which cut off the oxygen supply to the involved tissue, allowing the anaerobe to proliferate. Specimen, um, the treatment usually is surgery to restore oxygen and remove the necrotic tissue plus antimicrobial therapy. Specimen collection can be important for the anaerobes. We usually use a gel containing swab specific for anaerobes, an e-swab, evacuated vials that are free of oxygen. Main thing you wanna remember is do not refrigerate the specimens because it will cause a greater absorption of oxygen in the colder temperatures and could lower the numbers of anaerobes viable for culture. One of the ways that you can do anaerobic culture is to use some very nice media known as Pratt's media. These are pre-reduced anaerobically sterile. The media is packaged in an oxygen-free environment. If you're not able to go in that direction, you just need to use uh, pre-reduced agar in your media, in your laboratories rather, and you, the most common anaerobic culture media used will be CDC anaerobic blood, which is a very enriched blood agar. Canamycin, vancomycin blood auger, which can select for a certain gram negative variety of anaerobes, bile esculent augers, thioglycolate broth, and a chopped meat glucose broth, which has basically necrotic meat in it, which can nurture for the most fastidious of anaerobes. You have to do something to grow them. You can't expose them to oxygen. So you can use anaerobic chambers and work in an oxygen free environment, or you can use anaerobic gas pack jars. The older jars used a wet pack where you would add water to a hydrogen and CO2 generating envelope. In these, you'd have to have a palladium coated catalyst that produced heat to start the reaction. Over the last decade or so, we switched to dry packs. These absorb oxygen and generate CO2. So you're creating an anaerobic environment to be able to grow your organisms. The most common anaerobe that we see is Bacteroides fragilis group. 
This is a pleomorphic, irregularly shaped, gram-negative bacilli. It's found as normal flora in the GI tract and is the most common gram-negative normal flora anaerobic in the GI tract. It grows in the presence of bile, and that means it will grow on bile esculent media, and it will turn the media black. It grows because it can grow in the presence of bile, and it will break down the esculent to esculetin, forming that black pigment. It's resistant to penicillin and canamycin, Infections are usually related to something going wrong with the bowel, and you can get things such as GI abscess. There's five organisms that comprise the BFRAG group, uh, the BFRAG being the most common species. BFRAG has become resistant to penicillin by beta-lactamase enzyme production. Metronidazole is usually considered the drug of choice. However, over the re uh, recent years, there has been some resistance um, reported to metronidazole, making susceptibility testing more necessary. Prevotella and Porphyromonas used to be uh, um, bacteroidae species, but they have been reclassified. They are pleomorphic gram-negative rods and found as normal flora in the upper respiratory tract. Infections are usually respiratory tract abscesses. They will not grow in the presence of bile. They will not turn black on bile esculin media but they will do two unique things. They will produce a unique brick red fluorescence. When you grow them on a blood auger plate, after about a week, you put them under a UV light and they will fluoresce. The other thing, over about one week's time, they will form a black pigment when grown on blood auger. Musobacterium species are very important anaerobes and they have very unique gram staining. Nucleatum forms a very long, thin, gram-negative bacilli as seen in the stain. It's spindle-shaped with pointed ends. This organism is normal flora in the upper respiratory tract and usually causes infections in the mouth, respiratory tract, and liver abscess. It also causes the unique infection of Benson's angina, which is a necrotizing oral co-infection caused by Fusobacterium and spirochetes. Look at the gram stain of necrophorum. It's a gram negative bacilli that filaments or chains uh, forms chains of rods. It is known to be the cause of Lemire syndrome, an oral pharyngeal infection which leads to thrombosis in the jugular vein, septicemia, and carries a very high fatality rate. Clostridium species. This is a gram positive bacilli, boxcar shaped, looks much like bacillus species. It also may over decolorize and appear reddish, so caution on your gram stains. Also, it can form um, the spores, which can form uh, blank spots in the gram stain. Infections is the most common one is Clostridium perfringens. It can cause food poisoning, necrotic tissue abscess, bacteremia, and cholecystitis. It is the most common anaerobic gram-positive rod in the intestine. Three important things can be observed with perfringens. On the right-hand side, you can see that it produces a double zone of beta hemolysis. It also produces lecithinase when grown on an egg yolk auger. Lecithinase will cloud the auger. It also produces a positive reaction on the reverse CAMP test. Botulism and tetanus are two important clostridial infections. Clostridium botulinum, the adult disease, is when you have preformed heat labile neurotoxin ingested from a food source. Usually it's in mass produced or even home canned foods. Infant disease is different. Infant disease, you actually ingest the spore from nature, either from eating a product made in nature like honey or from household dust. The spore will then germinate in the gut producing neurotoxin. It begins with constipation and difficult sucking a bottle. Both forms are life-threatening neuroparalytic diseases. Tetanus is, a, of course, a gram, uh, is a also formed one from clostridium, and if you look at the gram stain, you can see that it forms tennis racket type sporulation. This infection, of course, begins with penetrating skin injury with introduction of the tetanospasmin toxin. 
You can get spasmic contractions of voluntary muscles, hyperreflexia with trismus, which is the classic lockjaw associated with tetanus. We immunize to prevent this infection. Septicum is an important species that we can see in uh, our regular laboratories. It can cause bacteremia or gas gangrene in a patient with underlying malignancy. It's a hematogenous spread from the GI flora. No trauma is necessary to have this happen in the immune suppressed. Clostridium difficile, of course, has been renamed to Clostridioides. Um, this disease, we could talk forever about it, but the disease is an antibiotic associated colitis. It causes classically pseudomembranous colitis from the toxin production of the organism. You can have toxin A and toxin B production. Toxin B is thought to, to be the most uh, primary virulence factor for C. difficile. It is a potent cell cytotoxin. There can also be a binary toxin produced. This was the classic NAP1 strain of about a decode, decade ago, which produced a large amount of toxin, uh, larger than toxin B is capable of producing. Diagnosis um, is um, uh, up to hospital situations to create algorithms which are best. They can usually include an EIA method for toxin A and B. These are insensitive methods, but they're quite useful for looking for active toxin. Molecular methods are very sensitive, but they only detect toxin genes. So usually there's a combination of the two used uh, for uh, proper diagnosis of C. difficile infection. You can also use CCFA auger if you wish to culture, but this is usually only for research purposes these days. Actinomyces is a branching gram-positive bacilli, does not form spores. It's aerotolerant at times, but best grown anaerobically. Normal flora in oral, GI, vaginal, and skin. Infections, you can have oral facial actino, which causes lumpy jaw, also respiratory and GI infection. Classically, they form sulfur granules in tissue, which is a concretion of the organism in a microcolony in tissue. Actinomyces israeli is the most um, featured uh, organism in the genus. It's associated with oral, thoracic, and abdominal infections, and the classic one is IUD infections. It causes breadcrumb colonies in broth, and it's susceptible to penicillin. The, the gram stain of actino is often looks like antlers. Also, actinomyces israelii can cause a molar tooth colony where it literally looks like a tooth sitting on the media. And finally, Propionibacterium acnes, renamed QT bacterium acnes. This is a pleomorphic gram-positive rod capable of small branches, catalase positive and indole positive. It's found as normal flora in the skin, oral, GU, and GI areas. It's a contaminant in blood cultures from skin contamination. It's a pathogen of acne vulgaris. One of the most important things over the last decade, it is an increasing and emerging pathogen of cerebral shunt infections and endovascular and neurosurgical infections, and certainly been established as a significant cause of prosthetic joint infections particularly joint and uh, shoulder and joints. Um, cultures um, in, uh, should be held seven to 14 days and the therapy of choice is ampicillin. That ends our discussion, the second part of the lecture. Um, I hope you have gained some knowledge about these organisms and I wish you best in your studies. Thank you very much for listening.